Hello everyone and welcome back to our course, our course on commercial open source startups. This is the last lecture in the middle part. Uh, so far we covered open source and open source projects and also commercial open source, the basic business models. Now in the last 10 years there has been one dominant strategy in commercial open source which is to lift the open source software into the cloud and to provide the open source project as a cloud service to pay for. And that has become so important that uh, I will dedicate almost the full lecture now to this particular uh, strategy of commercializing an open source software. So the first thing to discuss uh, even before we go into the cloud is to remind ourselves that open source itself does not bring in revenue, only something complementary to the open source that is only available to pay for uh, will bring in any revenue. As a consequence, the product manager of a commercial open source uh, company or startup needs to understand very well what it is they give away for free, the open source that they make no money off, and then what they keep closed and which they sell to customers. The key here is to understand that while providing open source to the world for free gives or creates value with users, uh, you don't capture any yet if they don't become your customers. But as you gain customers from the open source project, you actually capture the value of the open source project as much as you provide their additional value through your closed features. Here's the product management challenge again. How do you convert uh, non-paying users to paying customers? And um, you may remember how we split the uh, services and the product into the, uh, that's the industry terminology, usually community edition of the software and the commercial edition, where the community edition is the open source software, so the software provided under an open source license, and the commercial edition is the same, but now under a commercial license, plus all the stuff that makes customers buy, the basic, the core product, then turned into a basic or a whole product. And commercializing uh, open source means identifying the functionality that customers are willing to buy for. And this is not to, to pay for. And that is not just, uh, I dream it up this way. This actually requires a hard look at the market to identify how what your competitors provide is similar or different. And consequently, what is not differentiating what everyone has. Uh, so that type of features is nothing that a customer will pay for. Hence, it should not be part of a closed offering or not predominantly part of a closed offering. Then there are features why your users uh, come to your open source software. It's the reason to use. It creates a value for your users if they use the open source software. And finally, you want to distinguish and keep closed reason to buy features functionality that you don't make available as part of the open source software, but that will give uh, users the reason to buy and to become, uh, become customers. So you create more value with the reason to buy features for users who then become customers. And now it is you, the vendor, who captures the or some of the original value that previously the users um, uh, captured 100% as they use the free and open source version, the community edition. So here is basically a layered view of your software, of your product. At the bottom are the community open source features, the non-differentiating features. You can even develop those with competitors. There's nobody buys because they can save a file to disk. Then there are the reason to use features, which distinguish your open source software from from others. It's why users come and use your software. And then again, on top of that, 
uh, reason to buy features why users come and actually become customers. And so the challenge is, what are these reasons to use and reason to buy features? Sometimes for product managers, it's even a challenge to understand what's non-differentiating, but I hope you will uh, be smart enough to, to figure that out. So here's one way of how to think about feature differentiation. Um, you can have two dimensions, the two markets, consumer or enterprise. And you can have an application domain, the business functionality from the business perspective, and a technical domain, how do you operate this cost efficiently. So consumers are usually not a good uh, target, not a good market for uh, commercial open source, uh, but they might be uh, marketing, doing marketing for you. So it's not that consumers couldn't be helpful, you're just not making any money of them. So an example um, for a consumer uh, uh, package, open source, commercial open source would be MySQL, the database, because um, consumers need that. I run my web server of it. I would never pay for a service for MySQL, really, or at least not directly. So the application functionality is it stores my WordPress blog, for example. So that must be free and I'm unlikely to pay for it ever. Now, the commercial open source firm could enhance that in these two dimensions. It enhances it uh, to cover additional needs that enterprises might have as opposed to consumers. For example, uh, enterprise readiness features like uh, attaching the directory services of a company um, higher quality authorization, authentication, identity services, basically all the kind of additional functionality that is important for a company, but not for me as a freeloading home user. So there is a feature differentiation in terms of additional functionality. And that might, that's most easily um, done across a big gap from consumer to enterprise. Because if you withhold additional functionality from consumers that consumers need, they may not react so nicely and you may not get the marketing benefits. In fact, you might get quite the opposite, upset users who will complain that you're withholding functionality from them. The world is not fair. You're making them a gift, but uh, users may not care. They may expect uh, everything for free all the time. That's a little bit, little bit different if we cross over, for example, from application domain to technical domain. Here again, technical domain is something that is not the business function of the package, but rather something like operation in a cloud at scale, which is the canonical example these days. So you can have a database and operate it yourself like I do on my web server, but operating a cloud at scale for many different customers in a cloud will give you uh, a cost advantage uh, or will give the provider a cost advantage so that they can operate it cheaper and at higher quality of service than say I could do it myself. I don't know about the uh, availability of my web server. It's probably not enterprise uh, great. So here then is another feature differentiation or a complement, uh, the quality of service at which a software is being operated uh, for you and the differences between what the user could do themselves or, and what you, the original developer of the software, could do, which is probably much better and as a consequence something that uh, customers pay for. Now here's an example, um, a database company, Yugabyte, mm, which I viewed for a while as a kind of secret tip, but now I think they got a Series C of 120 million um, dollar or so, so they are probably well known by now. And they actually open sourced all of the business functionality of a database, of an SQL database, distributed SQL in this case. So they didn't even make a distinction any longer between consumer and enterprise. They are not, to my knowledge, withholding any additional functionality that only maybe enterprises would need. Uh, and consumers would not need. And so there is no difference between what enterprise and consumers get in the actual 
business functionality, which is distributed SQL. However, operating it in the cloud requires additional management software. So we're crossing over from the application domain into the technical domain. And that additional management software is not available for free because that's the competitive advantage of Yugabyte over any competitor who's operating Yugabyte DB in the cloud. And so that's what they withhold, but to most customers it will be understandable that operating a database in the cloud incurs cost that maybe they should uh, pay for. So I will now walk through um, what I just called feature differentiation or a closed complement. And the original model, perhaps when it became most clear to people, was uh, called the open core model or in more general terms, intellectual property modularity. You can split your code uh, into different packages, modules of different licenses. And so you could have your intellectual property split into modules and one module would get an open source license and the other would only get a closed to pay for proprietary license. That's called IP modularity. A particular, and, and, and that is uh, that type of uh, IP modularity is uh, applicable to software, it's applicable to hardware, to services and so forth. So here you can see the uh, complementarity actually then of uh, software, hardware and services using examples. There is the, uh, there's uh, BERT, uh, the, uh, or there's, you could have a business intelligence report editor by which you can create reports, but for running uh, business intelligence tools, not just designing nice reports, you might, you also need the actual execution engine, which will gather the data and present the data in the form as defined by the report. And so you could split software into two parts where um, one is free and useful, but the other is not free and not, and so you have to pay for it. A well-known example these days on the hardware level is uh, TensorFlow, or the hardware software. It's TensorFlow, the software, and Google's TPUs. Uh, tensor processing units, which you can use as a service in Google uh, in the Google Cloud. So here we have a machine learning library, TensorFlow, which is software and which is open source. And in the uh, cloud uh, of uh, Google, uh, you can rent GPUs, which will speed up the computation of a TensorFlow application significantly. So that hardware is proprietary, the chips are proprietary, and of course the cloud service around it is to pay for. And so the complement is that's closed is the hardware and the cloud service around it. And Google gives you a lot of value uh, with the free open source library, TensorFlow, but then recaptures all of it as you pay Google to operate or run the algorithms using TensorFlow in there in G on GCP. Services is the same. Uh, that's just the exa That's the example I just presented. A database you can operate it yourself, so you get the software for free as open source software. But then you have to pay for if you want to use uh, the cloud version operated at a high level, higher level of quality of service than you could do yourself by say the original vendor or a hyperscaler. So you have this complementarity of something that's available for free, creates value for the user, but then there's something additional, the complement that is not available for free, the closed complement. And if you pay for that, those who sell it to you actually recapture all of the value of the open source and the closed complement. And that's how they make money. A particular name that you might have heard of is uh, called the Open Core Model. That's a particular arrangement of IP modules where the openly licensed uh, module is the core of the software. It's kind of the bare bones software. And then any additional features around it are closed and are the closed extensions of the Open Core. 
and that is something that people recognized maybe 15 years ago and became known as the open core model. Now, that is what people recognized 15 years ago and then companies rearranged and suddenly everyone was an open core company, which of course annoyed users because users don't like um, being what they might think is being fooled as they need features that they run into a paywall to access them. I mentioned this earlier by splitting markets into consumer and enterprise. If there's a really nice boundary between markets and one market is fine with the pure open source version, but the other one is not and the other one is willing to pay, then things are good. But if the market which is not willing to pay thinks they are being withheld features they really need, uh, then you will uh, be uh, the open core model may create a lot of stress for the vendor because well the names that um, open source enthusiasts have come up with indicate that they are not very happy goes from faux pen op uh, open source to uh, crippleware and it does mean that uh, you really uh, might be facing a backlash if your product manager is not able to cleanly delineate what is open and free and what is not and how this also separates demographics into those who are never going to pay and would be very upset still if they are being withheld something they think they should get versus those who have no problems uh, paying. So um, open core users worry uh, about functionality not that they need not coming their way any longer being withheld at some point of time uh, that the company uh, stops supporting and evolving the open uh, the open core or the software as a whole and so forth so commercial open source does create worries uh, with users one way of addressing it that i found helpful is to actively address these concerns so I call that the commercial open source pledge. If you feel comfortable as a company to say that you're not going to screw your users, <laughs> uh, then you can make that explicit because then hopefully you can generate trust. That's one thing, but also um, it will be much less convenient for you to indeed um, screw your users at some later point of time. As a consequence, actually, I don't know a company which has picked up this idea. Uh, they all want to leave it open what they do in the future and that's understandable uh, business common sense perhaps but it also creates that backlash and mistrust that I just mentioned so the best compliments um, again are those that have high value to users and where the users do not feel it is something they should get for free and that these days is clearly the cloud Operating software in the cloud uh, incurs hardware cost, incurs storage, incurs uh, computational costs. And so a user intuitively understands that they cannot get it for free, uh, really. They may quibble with the prices, but they don't question that there has to be some price. Which is why we get these cloud companies now and taking an open source strategy. So uh, the example was, um, say, Yugabyte. There's an open source software you can operate yourself for free, or you um, pay a company to operate it for you uh, at assumed higher quality of service and so forth. Now, why would a competitor not use that software and compete, say, with Yugabyte? Why would a competitor not pick up some open source software that's out there and operated themselves in the cloud competing with the original vendor. And that would push prices down, right? And that would not be in the interest of the original vendor. So the original vendor needs to make sure that somehow the competition doesn't find it attractive, doesn't find it attractive uh, to compete with you. Um, one way is of course to protect your trademarks but uh, that can then lead to a fog of the uh, software. And hence, uh, we have examples of that. Compare and ERP software uh, had the 
nasty surprise that if you wanted to upgrade from one version to another, you had to pay uh, the company because the upgrade scripts for the database schema uh, were not available for free. So suddenly users were forced to pay or get stuck on an old version. Many hated that and they hated it so much that there were many forks of Compare and one right now, Adam Pierre, is reasonably successful. MySQL uh, was forked into MariaDB and a local favorite, Isinga, is a fork of uh, Nagios, uh, the um, uh, data center and event monitoring uh, solution. So that's one thing that competitors can do and then they can compete with you. How do we make that unattractive as a vendor? So as mentioned, you should be owning the intellectual property, uh, the copyright, the trademarks and what have you. If a competitor forks, they can only use the open source license that you put on the code base as their own license as you are unlikely to sell them a license or they are unlikely to ask you to pay for a license because then they are dependent on you. Uh, the competitor has to remove all the trademarks and so forth and if there are patents in there they will have to work around the patents. So you should own the intellectual property and acquire the rights to any contribution you accept from the outside world so that again 100% of the key IP is owned by you. With that then you license out using open source an open source license in such a way that it's unpleasant to fork. For example, you can use a copyleft license for the open source software. While your customers get a commercial license, that's dual licensing. It's actually very common. Now, what should be the open source license? Well, if you use a copyleft license, then any competitor which uses your uh, code base under the copyleft can only do so under the copyleft license, which means anything they add has to be open sourced. I'm simplifying when anything they add or modify uh, has to be open sourced and as a consequence they have to provide it to users and customers and as a consequence they cannot build a competitive advantage by keeping closed some additional algorithms or functionality that they developed. So it is not a great value proposition because all their investment cannot go into a sustainable uh, advantage. It always has to go out due to, due to the copyleft um, license to, to their users. There's only one problem with that. Um, you can't always license out using a strong copyleft license because some of your users may not like it. So let's go back to the use cases of open source licenses. Remember there is the in-house use case where basically the software is an application and you're using it in-house for whatever business purpose you have for it. And then there is the uh, open source component which is uh, something that a vendor would pick up, put it into their product and then distribute it onto customers. So the second use case again is the distribution use case and the copyleft uh, clause only triggers for distribution. So you can provide your application under a 100% aggressive AGPL version 3 copyleft license and then no competitor will touch it. But you can't do that for components um, because if you do it for a component, your customers, your future customers would also not do it or would not use it. So here you can see it. If it's an application, you do a license under a commercial license or under the AGPL. The users, your user community doesn't worry about the AGPL because they are not passing on the software. The obligation to open source any attached code does not hit them. But if your users or your customers are vendors who um, put your component like a database or some monitoring or something into their own business applications that they sell, then their own product would have to be 
uh, licensed out under the AGPL. And they obviously don't like that. So as a consequence, those who try to, those commercial open source vendors, single vendor open source firms who try to keep competitors away by using, uh, using copyleft licenses, did shield or shielded their users from the effect of the copyleft license with permissively licensed chims here in the right you can see there is the MIT licensed code around the copyleft licensed core of the software and so that MIT licensed code would be the uh, client libraries or the APIs that were user facing were other vendors would use your component and program against your component and using these shims their code would be shielded from the copyleft effect of of the um, core uh, AGPL licensed uh, code and so that worked for a while until about 2018 uh, and I'll come to that in a second so here is how a single vendor open source firm would look at what they should be doing. If they are selling an application, they can make it AGPL version 3 uh, for all purposes. Um, if it's a component and there's only an on-premise deployment situation, then they can make it GPL version 2. If it was in the cloud, it would have to be AGPL version 3 because it's a cloud copyleft license, but plus the shims uh, because otherwise users future customers would not touch it. So what changed a couple of years ago is of course the advent of uh, the hyperscalers. So everything was moving into the cloud, but it happened in layers, meaning that a provider like MongoDB of the Mongo database, MongoDB database, Mongo database, um, they would provide their software in the cloud, but they would also use some of these huge infrastructure investments by here the big three hyperscalers, AWS, uh, Azure, Microsoft Azure, so Amazon Web Services, Microsoft Azure, or Google Cloud. And these three companies provide, and now the, uh, some of the Chinese too, like Alibaba, uh, they provide the infrastructure of much of what is running in the cloud, including the software for those single vendor open source firms who are operating their open source software as a service in the cloud for their customers. Now, um, because, uh, uh, so, and if you're MongoDB, then maybe everything's fine until AWS or Azure or uh, Google Cloud recognizes it's open source. Why don't we operate it for clients? Why do we let uh, MongoDB get all the revenue from this popular, from this popular uh, um, open source project? And the key thing is the hyperscalers are actually able to do that. Uh, MongoDB and Yugabyte and all those are withholding the software to manage their cloud at scale for many users, um, but uh, so there's no direct competitor who could compete with them because they don't have that management software. But uh, Amazon Web Services and the hyperscalers, they have their own infrastructure to scale out some open source project in the cloud. It's totally different software. It's their infrastructure software, but it is competitive to the cloud management software of, say, MongoDB and so forth. So as a consequence, there's a threat, not necessarily, it didn't necessarily happen, but there was the threat that the hyperscalers could take the community edition of an open source software and operate it cost efficiently and at high quality of service in the cloud for, uh, for their own customers where the original developer, single vendor open source firm behind the project would have hoped that the hyperscaler customers would actually be their customers. And in order to prevent that, the single vendor open source firms decided that the only way to do so is to relicense. So what happened is that uh, MongoDB and others introduced a new so they simply introduced, relicensed 
but it quickly became known as a new license category called the source available licenses. What Mongo and others were trying to achieve is a license that in essence said you're allowed to do with this code what uh, an open source license, our original open source license would allow you to do. We really don't want to change anything about that, but you're not allowed to compete with us. That's the only restriction. Now, when you think back to my introduction of open source licenses, adding restrictions of use, restricting the field of use, the application and so forth, turns the license into not an open source license. So MongoDB relicensed and others relicensed their code from an open source license or a set of open source licenses to their own source available license, not open source any longer, but serves the purpose that the hyperscalers won't touch it. What the hyperscalers in some cases are doing is to fork the last uh, last known um, open source version. So for example, Elasticsearch got, so got forked into OpenSearch, I think by AWS. And so they are now maintaining a fork and it's a separate, um, separate piece of software. Now, these open source licenses, there are various of those, it's lawyers at work, but they all say the same again, it's a license like open source, but if you are, want to compete with the property or copyright owner, then you are not allowed to do that. You can see it here, um, how MongoDB relicensed um, the core of its um, uh, database server uh, into SSPL. And so Amazon Web Services can't use that because they do not have the rights according to the license. The connectors and drivers and what have you are still permissive. So they are Apache uh, 2.0 licensed and the cloud management always was commercial and proprietary. Here is how other companies did it. MariaDB actually already before uh, Mongo um, relicensed some of uh, the additional functionality, the proxy server. Um, around the original MySQL that they kept developing. Relicensed that from GPL version 2, uh, a copyleft license that they had used and that to which they, um, to the code of which, behind which they um, owned all rights, to uh, the business software license, another source available license. Confluent um, and so forth, uh, um, Redis Lab, etc. Um, reality is always more complex. So here you can see uh, Redis, um, which is an in-memory database, and you can see how the core component in the middle uh, is now the Redis source available license. And um, still there is a lot of, uh, lot of uh, stuff that's just in the BSD. And of course, there's the commercial uh, functionality, added functionality that you only get if you are a paying customer of Redis Labs. I think uh, that it wasn't necessarily uh, it wasn't necessary to be so harsh. Um, I think that the uh, uh, single vendor open source firms could have done it a bit more nicely and not left lost. So. By, um, by changing the open source license to a source available license, people now rightfully complain it's not open source any longer, so they lost open source street cred and goodwill. I think they simply should have added the source available license and next to a continuous AGPL3 license. And with that, um, uh, the AGPL version 3 license would have kept the hyperscalers away while the source available license would have allowed the use by all the potential customers who have no intent of competing with the original firm. They just wanted to use their stuff as a component in their own products. So the version on the right is not, it's my proposal, not used by anyone, but in my opinion, then they would not have lost the goodwill of the open source community as some have.
So back to, uh, so here's a comparison of how commercial open source can control um, uh, the project they make available under an open source license. They definitely maintain all the copyright. Uh, if there are patents, then they will not license out the patent. Uh, I would assume the trademark certainly is 100% maintained by the company. They should own all the domains and associate it with a trademark and they definitely uh, employ the people developing the software so that social leadership is always with the company and they can give and take the commit rights to the project. Um, in the worst case, the project is even developed behind closed doors, so it's only dumped onto the world, which is not the nice style, but uh, some do. Uh, one more word on what open source means for, um, for the developers. Um, because the economics of being a developer, the labor market dynamics are changing. So with community open source that's valuable as components to, uh, uh, to companies, developers who have an important role in these components um, are positioning or can, positioning, can position themselves better in the marketplace. So here's the career ladder again, and we can see how um, you climb through these ranks and you gain more influence as a developer. And that is actually worth something to uh, employers. So if you are a successful developer in an open source project, then first of all, it means your technical skills are verifiable. They're out there on GitHub and everyone can take a look at the code you write. So you have basically a portfolio of projects on GitHub or elsewhere that potential or future employers can look at, read your code and decide on whether you're a good developer or not. These verifiable technical skills can be important in general if companies are just looking for good developers, but also if they are looking for people who specifically know an important uh, Project. So your verifiable skills are generally valuable and specifically valuable if an employer, potential employer is interested in that specific project. Also, not to be neglected, is that if you're successful in open source, it says something about your social skills um, or uh, more precisely, the other people in the project by working with you signal more or less that they are willing to work with you. So there's what I call peer confirmation here about this competencies that are there in the code. It's the technical skills because they made you say a committer. If you have a committer status, then the peers confirmed you are a technically competent person but they would never make you a committer if you're really not a nice person. So there is the implication also that you can work in a team and that you have certain social skills that make uh, that don't make anyone, everyone run away screaming, but rather you are an agreeable person to some extent at least. Finally, if you're really a committer in a project and maybe even a large project, it confirms or the peers confirm that you have leadership capabilities because, well, that's exactly what you do. And so the peers confirm it by making you one of them. If you actually have a high ranking position committer or even project management committee member or leader even, then you have high visibility to a project in the project, possibly valuable projects to employers. And you can by discussing, by example, by suggesting, you can take influence not only where the project is headed, but also guide people, uh, developers who want to be committers or who are just looking for fun by guiding them in a direction that works for you and maybe even the employer. So in a committer or PMC member or even leader status, you can channel other people's conf contributions, influence where the project is headed, reach out to the community for help and what have you. So a valuable position inside this, so a high ranking position inside a project gives you power and influence. And of course, then 
if an employer hires you, some of that becomes usable uh, to the employer as well. The results for you, the future or the potential employee, the developer looking for a job, is that you find yourself in a much better negotiation position. You have this added value, um, verifiable skills, peer confirmed skills, and even uh, even uh, a position of influence, obviously. And that means ultimately um, higher salary effectively when compared with others. You also probably not easily let go because that's added value that's hard to come by. And because you will also probably be asked to not only keep working on the open source project, but bridge into the company, you have a richer or more varied work experience than someone who's not active in open source. So finally, what actually happens with um, what actually happens with uh, open source is that the single vendor open source projects, of course, also have some sort of life cycle similar to uh, the one I've showed before. You launch, you grow, you reach maturity, and eventually uh, there might even be sunsetting. What's interesting is how different features evolve, uh, in particular as classified by non-differentiating reason to use, reason to buy. And Almost invariably, um, projects will be much more open in the beginning and close down over time. One of the worries that users have with single vendor open source, but that's simply how it is. You uh, are nice in the beginning, you try to drive adoption, eventually you become just another enterprise software with regular sales and there's much less of a need for an open source strategy. That's at least the thinking and it's at least the actual behavior we see in the market. So you can see here how work is invested in the beginning more into the open source code base. Uh, there may be nothing that's being held back, but over time the close complement, the reason to buy features keep growing until they become most of the work and uh, take over the product. Eventually the product uh, is will not be much valuable open source any longer. And so we've seen that, for example, with Sugar CRM, which is still around as its independent company, but not really much of open source going on there. So that's it. We talked about closed complements as the key to commercializing and capturing the value of open source that you made available freely. The licensing challenges, the challenges through the hyperscalers for anyone who uses the cloud as a key complement and some more labor economics and so forth. Thank you very much for your time and attention. And after and with this lecture, we close the uh, open source and commercial open source part and switch to the third part startups, startups out of university in the next session, which starts the final, the third part of the course. See you then.